Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to BIM Managers Set the Stage for Increased Knowledge and Productivity at Payette. My name is Richard Taylor of ID8 Software. Um, I am thrilled today to have our presenters be Dan Gallivan and Cara DePiro, who will be the main pre presenters today. And they are physically located in Boston, Massachusetts at the Payot office. I'm also located near Boston, and I've been very fortunate enough to experience firsthand the amazing work that Payette has done ac across the, uh, the, the city of Boston and uh, you know, improving the built environment. Now, you're going to see that they do work not only in the, in the New England or in the Boston area, but all around the world, so I don't want to steal their thunder. So without further delay, I want to introduce Dan and Kara, and I want to thank you very much for being on the webinar today. Good morning, Richard. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you. What we were looking to do was just sort of sort of talk through our story and our process. So I'm Dan Gallivan. I'm the director of IT here at Payette. I have about 25 years of experience, uh, specifically with CAD and BIM. And um, you know, one of the things I've recognized over time is that my position is more about people than it is somewhat about technology. And I mean that by saying that I'm really here helping people uh, navigate their way with uh, technology. And uh, as we also mentioned today, joining me is Cara DiPiero, the manager from MyCAD. And uh, what we're looking to do in sort of the story is really just talk about how we at Payette um, try to maintain focus on quality design and leveraging um, BIM consultants, uh, specifically MyCAD, and together this is our story. So, who is Payette? Uh, Payette, um, you know, we are architects and working to be innovative for our clients, you know, working to overcome their design challenges. And one of the things that sort of a, a motto of our firm is the fusion of design uh, and performance and you know we work with high performance buildings and sometimes it's not the most uh, attractive or people think uh, you know great design challenge but we actually do embrace the opportunity uh, and we you know we utilize BIM heavily into our process as well as a different um, array of tools and techniques and following industry best practices uh, working together with MyCAD you know across the firm educating, sharing, and trying to really help develop and grow our staff. Uh, we recognize that, you know, we need to constantly improve and sort of continuously train our employees. And that's where we really try to leverage that expertise of uh, MyCAD to assist us. So we also know that we need to maintain a uniform level of quality across the practice. And uh, together, we really uh, deeply value that relationship that we have to sort of work together and collaborate uh, on this journey. Um, as architects, you know, we, uh, we must have that bold mission statement, and this is ours at Payette. Um, we know that architecture, you know, is, you know, needs to be visually appealing and not confusing to the inhabitants or to the visitors to spaces. So, you know, we look at it as um, more than just architecture to help, you know, create our space, but we're really trying to, you know, study the programs study the design challenge and look at the use, uh, environmental performance, energy use, and we really try to leverage in what we call that design and performance, uh, working with our building science group. You know, we recognize that we need to uh, create healthy environments for you know, patients in our healthcare work, um, through scientists and researchers that are working in laboratory space, trying to make sure that they have you know, well-lit, naturally vented, uh, ventilated spaces. So, uh, we, you know, we also have some few unique projects like public architecture museums, and uh, we recognize um, and welcome a lot of those design challenges. You know, as Richard mentioned, we are based in Boston. Um, it's funny, we actually refer to our office as a single sort of large studio. It's a uh, large open workshop space. Uh, we actually do a fabrication space and actually will work on uh, a few unique projects at times, like uh, maybe designing a complementary bench or piece of artwork or something that maybe works with the building um, to also help sort of complement that design challenge. But we also, um, we work with sort of this integrated design practice where we really work across those different design areas within our firm. Um, we recognize that a lot of our 
architecture type or topology is STEM. So science, technology, education, math. And you know, we're, we're very excited uh, to work on those. We think they're extreme, um, they can be very challenging at times to sort of get great performing buildings in there. Uh, but we also try to do at that edge of design. And we're very fortunate that we work with some great clients and partners and we were just uh, given the award or would actually be presented this Friday at the American Institute of Architects uh, National Convention in Las Vegas. Um, place that's kind of a little bit of irony of uh, great architecture, um, but they're doing it in Las Vegas of faux architecture. Uh, but we are the AIA's uh, firm of the year for 2019. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and then one other thing we were just saying too with our office uh, being in Boston, you know, we overlook the four point channel and we feel there's an interesting narrative in watching the uh, tide come uh, in and out, that sort of ebb and flow of the tide every day is that it often uh, is a lot like our work. There's an ebb and flow to the cadence of the, uh, the work that we're on. Um, we've also received some national recognition and uh, for what it is that we do. And again, as we said, it's, uh, it's exciting to be able to work on some of the buildings that we do and uh, doing great architecture uh, and interiors work for some of these building topologies. Uh, I love to hear from you know students or people who occupy or use our buildings at times who you know they love to spend time in the science laboratory buildings because uh, they they might not be a STEM student but they love being in there because of some of those common spaces and uh, they just love the natural lighting and the uh, the comfort that it provides to them. So we're very excited by that. And as I mentioned with our building science practice. Um, We've received, in fact, this year alone, two of the COAT uh, AIA awards, which is the Committee on the Environment. So two of our new higher education science buildings just received uh, COAT awards, which we're very excited for as well. So uh, just a little bit more about the practice. Uh, as Richard mentioned as well, we are a global practice. So we do have a concentration of projects specifically with the, the East Coast of the US and uh, specifically within the Northeast. But then we do have projects stretching from Ireland through Russia across Europe into Asia, into Africa, and as well in the Caribbean. So, you know, we're really excited about trying to bring some of our design beliefs and practices, especially on the environmental side, to some of those other env uh, environments. Um, we like really pushing healthy environments, uh, healthy materials, natural lighting. So we're looking for more of those opportunities. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we do truly recognize that in our practice, um, our number one asset is our people. And uh, we really do work to try to grow and share knowledge and expertise. Uh, we also understand that we really need to can try to continue to cultivate that knowledge. And we want people to sort of focus on great to good design and sort of really focus on their job as architects. Um, so as I mentioned, we really like to grow our staff, but we also really like to help to try to grow with our clients and partners uh, as well, because we recognize that it's not a single entity that sort of pushes you forward, but it's working together with the right co combination of clients and uh, consultants, and that really helps grow us together. Uh, some of our clients, in fact, we've partnered with for decades, and some of the partners as well. So it's great to sort of be able to advance um, through the timing or the changing of the uh, technology and innovation over time. So it's really great to uh, develop that relationship. So, Tara? Well, <clears throat> what is MyCAD? Who are we? And why, uh, why do Payette hire us? Um, we are a company, there's currently 12 of us, um, BIM managers uh, and technicians. Uh, we provide services uh, across the board. Really, mainly our clients are architects. Um, we do work with facilities uh, engineers. We are located mainly in New England, uh, with the bulk being Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, uh, but we do have some in Florida. Um, but most of our clients are here in the New England area. Sorry, it's very New England based, but um, you know, considering basically what we do is IT service, it, it is uh, extendable. Um, we offer Office BIM implementation, Revit BIM training, I'm just reading the list, but you understand that. Um, BIM management and project consulting, um, scanning and as-built modeling, which is uh, not a huge part of our business, um, but our clients really enjoy that part. 
um, mainly with our facilities, it is um, hospitals and universities, which falls right into the Payette environment. Um, <clears throat> our staff mainly are previous architects. We've all studied and worked in architecture for years and years and realized that this is our strength. Um, we understand the design team issues that they face on a daily basis, and we understand that it's, you know, it's part technology, but it's mainly the people that get to drive the technology. We just happen to be very good at the software that we're using, um, and it's a constant learning curve. I mean, every day I learn new, new items. I mean, we all know Revit comes out with a new something every year, whether it be good or bad, um, <clears throat> and using the extras um, is very, very helpful. Um, you know, how do I uh, provide my service to make the designers do a better job on a daily basis is ultimately the goal. Um, so how are we working at Payette? Well, it's always ongoing. Um, we are constantly working on BIM limitation, you know, developing their template, developing uh, their libraries, making sure they're actually writing execution plans, um, new version updates, um, you know, constant training with um, with staff um, and that that varies from you know the interns up to project managers um, you know we understand that it's the full circle of the team that actually gets the job done well um, you know customizing the projects themselves I mean it could be anything from right just inception and getting the shared coordinates correct um, and maintaining that good health through uh, the entire life cycle that's really where ID8 fits in um, for me. And of course, project closeout, which um, not all firms are doing, but uh, we really do. Again, I mentioned that we work with facilities. Most of our clients, uh, the MyCAD clients, you know, Payette are one of our clients, but then they're working with a lot of the facilities that we're working. So we're really getting to see and, and a little bit dictate um, that full data circle. Yeah, I was just gonna say thank you, Kara, for that introduction. And one of the big things that sort of jumps out at um, one of the reasons why that we work with MyCAD is, as I mentioned, like we want our architects to be architects. We want them to focus on what they're doing. Um, MyCAD offers for us a group of not just people who know Revit, but they understand our business and they understand our people. Uh, as Kara mentioned, uh, their staff has architectural background. So they're coming at it from, yeah, we've done this. We've worked on these large projects. You know, we've worked on the complex projects and they offer um, us a certain level of understanding that really is just helpful and beneficial. Um, you know, it's hard for people if they're trying to learn from somebody who doesn't quite understand their building topology or what it is that they're ultimately trying to do as their mission. So we really do um, understand and appreciate their, uh, their expertise and their knowledge of what it is that we're trying to do. So. Again, uh, talking about Payette, and you know, we work on complex design challenges with our clients, and we're trying to help our client achieve their goal. Um, so we're trying to get them, you know, what's gonna uh, the program or the building or something that's gonna sort of meet what their challenge is. And it's funny because we often say like we don't necessarily have a, a typical project, um, you know, and in, with our projects themselves, you know. Like most everybody, we're doing BIM, um, we, you know, but we're doing multiple different models at times. You know, we're building study models, we're um, doing different design on different spaces, you know, we're executing different design options at times, and we're doing a ton of energy modeling as well now. And it's not always connected or is integrated um, in the design process because there's a lot of different iterations that are happening but oftentimes we're helping to sort of once the design um, challenge in a certain space is worked out, that's gonna be help incorporated back into sort of that main design model that we're gonna be using uh, for design intent. Um, you know, one of the other things that we often say too is that um, those models can then be developed and shared with that sort of extended design team, uh, whether it's the builders or the owners or you know, what might be going on with this particular project. Um, and then oftentimes we see it as people don't uh, look at it the same. Everyone has a little bit of a different expectation that they're trying to get out of it. Some people are trying to use BIM for operations, some are using it for equipment and coordination, uh, some want it for quantities and takeoff. So there's many different aspects. And as I said, we don't always want our study, our staff 
you know, being thinking about, oh, I've got to, uh, I've got to worry about this now. No, let's just worry about the design right now. Let's focus on, you know, your design challenge. And we need someone to maybe help keep them on track at the right time. And uh, that's what we often look at. So again, as I was saying, we don't have many typical projects. Um, we have everything from smaller complex projects, um, like this bio barn in uh, Pennsylvania uh, for Penn State, and uh, it's actually surrounded by dairy farms. It's an extremely impressive uh, small complex project. Um, to things like you know a very large complex project, which is five and a half million square feet, currently under construction. Uh, actual mammoth foundation for this building in uh, China, uh, which for the client was the first BIM project that they've seen, uh, as well as for a local associate firm that we were working with on the ground to help execute construction. So as you can imagine, this brings up its own set of challenges for our staff uh, to try to design, you know, a very complicated such large structure. So, you know, we've seen um, various iterations at times too of different type of um, BIM. You know, we've had different collaborative efforts. Uh, back in the day, we've done war rooms, collating staff together, uh, complex VPN connections in times, or accelerators to maybe share models, to more recent projects now that are leveraging BIM 360, and you know, with over 80 team members uh, in the project at the same time. And in some of these projects, we see a great variety, again, of trying to keep these models clean and efficient uh, and performing the way that we need it to. So, you know, these all bring up different uh, varying, you know, challenges for us. Uh, and it's interesting at times too, we sometimes have uh, projects that, you know, maybe the client uh, has a heavy BIM requirement for us that we need to keep on track or deliverable, uh, or sometimes there is no client requirement. So then strictly upon us as part of our own internal um, BIM execution process to sort of maintain our own level of communication for our staff that we're, you know, clearly communicating that design intent. And uh, that's where MICAD really helps to come in and keep our staff on track with designing and not over modeling or creating, you know, great design options, uh, you know, rendering objects at times, but then knowing, okay, we need to go into construction for this. Let us get more in, uh, strip that stuff out now and let's get it on uh, track for, you know, construction. So, you know, as we said, these relationships can vary whether we're sort of leading that design, uh, but we understand that we really need to keep the designers focused and uh, on track. So, as I mentioned, this is where, you know, MyCAD will help step in with us, uh, kick off the project from the beginning. And then what we do is look at Revit models we don't like to call them necessarily audits because no one ever likes to say, hey, I'm under an audit. Um, it always sort of has a certain connotation that goes with it. It might not sound great. So we look for something more palatable like a check-in. Um, we'll do these Revit model, model check-ins where preferably before major design milestones, we want our staff and we'll reach out and schedule time uh, to have MyCAD go through and check in on their model, see what's going on, keep the model healthy, uh, and then again, knowing, okay, maybe they're busy or super busy coming up through that deadline. So let's get in right after that deadline before the next phase to sort of make sure that things are being uh, coordinated well. And then also uh, maybe before there is, a, there is a formal handover of that project, knowing that we have good, clean, well-built models. So. so how does this all fit in with ID? We've heard a lot about Payette and who MyCAD are, but realistically, you're on this call to hear what ID8 does and how, truthfully, I use it. Um, I have been an advocate of the IDA tools for years. Um, before I joined MyCAD, I was with HOK for years um, and used it there on almost a daily basis. Um, now with MyCAD, <clears throat> I get to use the tools when I need them. Um, and here at Payette, it seems to be every time that I'm actually here uh, looking at models. Um, the tools, certainly have more than what I'm going to show you today, including the apps and the BIM link. Uh, but today I'll be showing you uh, Explorer. Um, and really, IDA software, this is their tagline, Fast Revit Data Discovery. I mean, I, ideally, that's what I am. I'm the data dork. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it helps me do major model cleaning without really having to be intimate with the model. 
Um, so today I'm going to be showing you um, how quick and easy things are. Um, so this first video will be about changing text. Um, and as you notice, you know, the IV8 Explorer pop is a nice little pop-up menu. Um, it's very user-friendly. Um, it allows to be stretchy. Uh, it is a very, you know, Windows uh, Explorer looking with plus minus um, values. Um, and this tool, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm using almost on a daily basis. Um, changing text is quite easy in this tool. Um, you know, here you can see there's pay it specific ones and a non pay it specific one. I don't have to know where it is, don't care, don't need to look it through a million sheets. And I'm quickly just going to change it back to a pay it standard type, and voila, it's done. Um, now, granted, okay, I was not in the right model for this one. Um, but it would it will allow you. Um, we took the wrong video on that one. That's okay. Um, the pop-up is very friendly, like I said, and I don't have to go through any views um, without you know changing what the the staff are doing. I can just change things very quickly. Uh, same scenario for line styles. I mean, realistically, um, this is a purge uh, by instance for the Revit environment, um, and you can see in this model. I mean, it's a very copy paste heavy, um, you know, I don't have to be in any specific view. I could come in here and see, you know, pay, uh, pay it staff copied in a whole bunch of stuff that shouldn't be in here. The ISIC 2 and, you know, pay it, the PAI, those are the ones that are supposed to be, the pen, zero, whatever, shouldn't be in here at all. Uh, but before I go in and start to delete uh, things individually, I'll check and explore to see what is actually being used. Um, what I should have said uh, during the display, you can look at the entire model, you can select specific items in Revit and have it show you just that, or you can just do active view. Um, but for this lines, it's very cool in that it will show you both model lines and detail lines, um, and will show you down to where is that one specific line. Um, so I can select one at a time, or I can select all uh, and change that particular style everywhere. That is not just individual lines, it's within field regions, it's within masking regions. Again, I don't have to be intimate with the design, it just, ID8 will do it for me. And notice, I mean, these are all the categories um, that are in the Revit environment. ID8 will allow me to do anything with any of those. So for those who are, uh, you know, on the data end, um, how does ID8 help with that? Well, it does highlight for me um, individual IDs, uh, very easy in uh, for finding things in Revit. And uh, you know, who who was the last person that worked on it? Uh, who do I need to go talk to? Again, I don't need to know who's on this project. I can find out via this tool and then go and figure out who do I need to talk to. So in this instance, I'm I'm looking at doors. Um, you know, looking at how many annotations are actually in there, but realistically, I want to maybe select one door, um, or I can select all of the doors and quickly look at the data behind all of this. Sure, I can go and find that via the Revit environment itself, but this is a very easy way to get all of those details: category, family type, name, work set, um, who you know, who did it, was it created by, and who has edited it last. But mainly I'm looking for that one specific ID. It's very helpful in large scale models when things start to go very crazy towards deadline. We all know people go a little nuts during that time. So Kara, you're saying um, a lot of these text styles and the line styles and trying to keep those models and sort of the housekeeping element. Are there things that you sometimes go into the models and say, hey, you know, these are performance causing issues. So, you know, keeping the data straight, keeping things what are some of the things that you'd look at that say, hey, these are really going to help keep your models performing well? Well, we all know that, you know, purging out the model often is a good thing. Um, you know, models can get really heavy. And although our our technology allows that, allows us to get larger and larger modules, um, you know, we know back in the day, 300 was the max. Now 500 is a pretty good one. But our computers actually allow us to have 800 plus. You know, is that a good model? Not particularly. I'm also looking at this again from the facilities end. What do I want to receive from you? Even the construction end, they don't need to see all this data. Uh, in terms of line styles and text styles, no, that's just, you know, cleaning. Um, it's really just house cleaning. It's, you know, the more 
quote unquote crap you have in there, the worse your your model is. Um, and that's kind of constant, and it's constant with the design team. You know, what I do on my end helps, uh, you know, keep the designers keep going on the design, and I'll do the quick cleanup so that we're 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 passing over a very clean model uh, in the end. Um, but in terms of uh, model health, warnings is a hot topic, and we all know that Revit out of the box, the pop-up menu is fine, it works. It's not great, but it works. Um, ID8 warnings uh, tool is way, way more helpful. Um, and in here, I'll show you, I mean, you know, the, the warnings box is teeny. Where we find it, it doesn't allow you to stretch. Sure, you can hit the plus boxes and, you know, see what's going on, but it doesn't really helpful. Um, it doesn't really overly appear intuitive. No, uh, and users are constantly asking me, well, which ones do I need to do? Well, the Explorer actually tells me um, you know, in in a very user-friendly way, red, green, yellow. I mean, these are things that you really should take care of. Um, and more so, it gets to the metadata of the actual element itself. And who was the one that last touched it? Why are there identical instances? You know, I can go and talk to that person. Did they merge a design option and not take care of things? I don't know. Um, and in here, it comes down to the ID. Like, do I want to go and search this out without having to know that model in, intimately. Um, you know, it, this I find extremely helpful. Um, but normally, I'm not doing the actual work for, uh, for the design team. I will highlight all of these things, look at them, and then discuss it with the design team. For those that are designers on this call, um, it is a very, very helpful tool. Um, just to determine what do you need to solve and why would you need to solve it. Um, I thought you made one interesting point too. You mentioned how the, the technology has changed. The computers are, you know, substantially faster. The hardware we're working on is faster. You know, there's more memory in there. Um, it's great. But as you said, good model management. It's not like back in the day of AutoCAD where, you know, model management, we all had to keep it really lean because everyone was aware of, you know, much slower technology they were working on. Now it's like, yeah, everyone has a Ferrari on their desk and they can drive it straight into a wall. And, build a behemoth of a model. So I think it's a great point that you raise in trying to, you know, focus the attention where it's best needed. Yeah. Um, for those that are really data driven, um, ID8 uh, also has a really excellent um, export value. So that say say you do want to track this history. I mean we typically aren't tracking. We just want to make sure that the model is uh, is healthy and is at a good um, you know, good level. I mean, we all know that you know saving takes forever. If you're waiting, you know, eight minutes for somebody else to save. Um, but this pop-up menu in the IDA tools allows us to really kind of <clears throat> sort by what do I want to look at, um, and you know, the ID of it, and I can export this. Um, and that's super cool that I can keep track if necessary. You know, uh, there are certain times of a project that we need to. I don't know make sure that the health of the model is actually getting better. 50% CD, 75% CD, 100%, and so on. Um, you know, really finding out, okay, well, did someone, the entire length of this project, were they the contributor of, of why the model wasn't great? I mean, this is, this is the tracking that, you know, if we look at this as an office management standpoint, well, okay, if this one person was really bad at modeling for the entire length, didn't learn anything, then we've got to pull them for the next job and teach them in a different way. I mean, it becomes kind of a twofold for me of finding um, model elements and fixing the model, but then being able to then train accordingly. Um, I was going to say, I know one big challenge for us, us oftentimes is manufacturer provided content where, you know, it's say a hospital space where someone's working with a particular piece of hospital equipment uh, and someone tries to go and download the manufacturer equipment and maybe they're doing, especially with some of the applications like we use now, heavy visualization, uh, VR components and people start to try to overpopulate the model with elements and it might be great during sort of one pres uh, presentation but now they don't need to sort of follow that through and it seems like you do a great job of going in and keeping the model healthy and lean swapping out the manufacturer downloaded content or trying to eliminate it from the start, um, you do a really good job of helping us try to keep that healthy and lean. And that's why we said it's important for us to uh, have those model check-ins with our staff and not just say, 
okay, it's the Wild West, go do what you want. Um, we want you to be great architects and focus on the architecture and design challenge. Um, and we'll try to help you know, keep you on the rails. It's constant activity. I mean, we all know that Revit models can get very ewy. <laughs> But realistically, you know, if I'm a part of the project from inception, I'm doing these checks at, you know, fairly often along along the way. Uh, when I was an architect using the tool, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, well, I do use it on a weekly basis now, but when I was actually in models on a daily basis, I would make sure that I gave myself the opportunity an hour on, you know, maybe Tuesday morning um, and really went through and made sure that things weren't going crazy. Um, you know, uh, like I said before, I'm the data dork, um, and you have to have one or many of those on projects. Um, and what makes my role here really unique is that, you know, Payette are more focused on the design and getting out a really good construction document set. And where I help them is, is being a little bit more productive so that things don't come to a crashing halt when the designers go really designy. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's interesting as we sort of, you know, look at this path of journey that we're on. And we recognize that, you know, we're in a bit of a unique time in our firm in that, you know, we have four generations of staff, you know, from the years of which uh, working across our workplace at the time, um, you know, and looking at the baby boomers that are getting near the end of their careers, the uh, Gen Xers, the millennials, and I think some Generation Z uh, entering the workforce now. And it's, it's a very unique to see that sort of uh, range of experience that we have. And you know, the, the tool sets that, you know, we used in architecture school and we used in early parts of our practice have, have completely changed. And, um, you know, people coming at it with these different experiences that they have. And it's, it's interesting that we truly do recognize we need to continue to, to train and educate and develop our staff, uh, but let them try to, you know, maintain their focus on doing uh, great architecture. Um, and we recognize too that, as I said, it's part of this journey that it's choosing the right tools, it's choosing the right partners. Uh, and for here, for Payette, you know, it's been my cat to help us as one of those partners to get through this. Uh, and it's tools like the IDA tool that help us at times, you know, keep efficient, keep lean, keep on track with what we're trying to do. Um, you know, and really try to let people focus on their strengths, which is that design step. And we often view it as, you know, we are on a journey and sort of doing this all together. So. Um, I think, I hope that this is a, you know, a story that's been worth sharing for people. Um, and, uh, you know, welcome any questions uh, about our product, uh, about the process and uh, how we utilize the tools. So uh, any questions out there, uh, Richard, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. There was a couple questions and it was really more focused on ID8 BIM link. And I just, I know that Kara had mentioned that and maybe you could just talk real briefly about, are you using ID8 BIM link to extract some of the parameter data and modify it and then um, input that back into Revit? Here, specifically here at Payette, no, um, because we are, um, we're very standardized in our shared parameters. Um, and anything that gets copied into the models, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of constantly tracking and looking, um, and it's really only the manufacturer downloads that, that kind of come in with kind of crap stuff. Um, so the answer to that is no, I'm not typically using Vim Link. Uh, we have in the past for um, added data that needed to be in model, for example, um, we had a project that had many fume hoods, and they wanted that data actually attached to the geometry. Um, and we did that via Excel and then pushed it in uh, via BIM link. Um, but in terms of, of parameters, no. OK. Well, Richard, I would, I would mm -hmm. just say we do have one of our groups has been using BIM link um, and working with some of our space programming inf information. So that is an area that I know they love that tool. We didn't uh, intentionally include that as part of today, but it is something that uh, they do love that tool. Yeah, well, there was just a couple questions concerning <clears throat> sort of manipulating parameters, editing information, and I know that kind of is beyond the scope of ID8 Explorer, so I, but we do touch upon that with ID8 BIMLink, so I wanted to uh, <clears throat> just make sure that we covered that. Also, this is a really good question, probably mostly for Dan. Um, so the question uh, it comes in that says, does PayUp provide data in the model as a service, 
or does it depend on the client? Like, for instance, I know you showed, you know, the Science Center at Northeastern University and, and what maybe Northeastern wants as a deliverable. So that's a good question as, you know, are you providing that extra data to Northeastern as an example, as a service? It's an excellent question. Um, and a popular answer I have to a lot of things is depends. It depends on the requirements from the clients. And we, we do find that a lot of our clients with these buildings, um, oftentimes there may be a BIM requirement. And in some cases, some are fairly sophisticated in what they're asking for in that information. Uh, so we, you know, we can deliver that if it's information that we do have. Uh, in some cases, it's just the data and not so much the model that we're after, which we can do. Uh, but what we often find right now is that a lot of clients know they want something. They're not quite sure what it is that they're going to want. Uh, we know that there's some that are trying to push the building operations groups now into gra grabbing some of that data. And also the types of projects that we work on, um, it can be many years from design through construction on a lot of our projects. It's not a quick turn oftentimes. So what we find is that in the beginning of the project, there may be no BIM requirement, but maybe as the project is progressed and even getting their handover, they're suddenly become, oh, the client now wants uh, a BIM deliverable. And then it sort of goes back and says, okay, well, what is, what, what is it that they're trying to get? And what we find is that it's really having that clear communication with them to say, what are your expectations to make sure that we can help deliver that? Um, as I mentioned, like you were oftentimes still trying to, say, model for design intent and not always for construction. And the G GCs and CMs that we're working with are often leapfrogging us in the development of the model uh, because they have to, you know, for them, time is money and for them to, you know, go in and put every bit of material in there or construction sequencing. Uh, it's much more important for them where, again, we're just sort of doing it with, for design intent. So I would find it um, important to have that communication with your design team and with your client to exactly be sure of uh, if there is that sort of requirement to make sure that you're they're getting what they're asking for. Yeah, great answer. Well, and, and along those lines, I guess, you know, you talked about, you know, LOD standards a little bit, and I guess there's this question here is that are you sort of uh, interested in implementing higher uh, level of detail standards in the model for the sake of design coordination with builders? This depends, I'm going to answer this question, this depends entirely on the contract. Um, and what we are finding is if the, if the end client is educated in their BIM requirements, then yes, they are requiring down to the specific, this is the naming convention for rooms, this is my naming convention for wall types, et cetera, et cetera. And Payette will bend to that because they're signing that contract with that one particular client. For those that don't have BIM requirements, um, Payette are using these tools anyways, and they have their own internal, um, you know, standards. Um, and they're following those standards as best they can. Um, I design teams again, you know, because they're designers, they would go off on a little bit of a, you know, whirlwind fun scenario. And my job is to kind of help rein, rein all that in and make sure that the data at the end of the day that's provided to whether it be it the construction team or the end client is something that was uh, either discussed or, you know, written down in an execution plan to say this is what pr what we're providing. A really good example is, you know, is the finished floor actually modeled or is it data attached to the room? Um, you know, these are things that when you term BIM, you know, it's just information. Where is that information happening? Is it data attached to geometry or is it geometry? Um, and it comes down to here at Payette, project specific. Um, and, you know, if that end client, like I said, has very specific BIM requirements, then yes, we will, we will change our ways so that it suits the man who's paying. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. That well, you know, we will, um, we will, we work with the clients, as I said, we're seeing a variety of different, uh, requests from clients at times in terms of what they want. And oftentimes, as I said, they don't know what they want yet. And they've even come back to us and said, Hey, we know you utilize this tool for, a building that was done five or ten years ago, can we get a copy of that? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, we will work with them to sort of deliver what their expectations are, you know, get within that range. And it can be an additional service because if you are asking, um, you know, we want something clean, light, and efficient 
to work through design. Um, and then in some cases, we've even said to them, said, hey, if you're really looking for that construction model at the end, maybe you should talk to the GC or CM. That might actually be your more developed model that shows closer. But again, it all sort of depends on what they're actually looking for. And that's why I say it's, uh, it's having that clear communication. You know, communicate with your group, you know, clear goals and objectives with your clients and uh, have your team understand what those are so that they're sort of all working together on that. Well, and also, this is kind of a, a like again, an additional follow-up, since, you know, I think the great answer to the question, like, and how are you tracking that within the model, or are you? For instance, the whatever the client has requested as their LOD, let's say, or even what they request, as Kara was saying, you know, what their the the floor finishes or whether it's a geometry or whether it's information do you track that through like revisions or certain deliverables or you know how is that or maybe it's a, a separate spreadsheet i don't know so typically at payette if i'm involved with the project it we start immediately with an execution plan and that allows the design team the members to understand what what do they need to do when um, and I know execution plans are discussed, you know, in our industry as a, oh, it's a, you know, it's a 30 some odd page document. Do I really need to do this? Well, yeah, you do because, you know, it, the project architect might know these, you know, the end goal, but the intern working doesn't necessarily know, um, <clears throat> you know, I am going to download all this manufacturer content, put it in there, but they're overloading things. Um, so, you know, are we tracking that through the process? Well, ideally, yes, but but we're not really, um, you know, writing that execution plan up front and then making sure that, that that document stays with the design itself. You know, you, we might issue that 15 times, depending on, on major changes. Level, level of development or detail um, in terms of our geometry, um, uh, you know, personally, I think it's a terminology that gets us very confused. Um, realistically, is it something that is, you know, contractor purchased and installed, owner purchased and installed? At the end of the day, by the time it's out of Payette's hand, they could have purchased chairs and installed different chairs. So do I really want the, the exact chair to go in that model? No, not necessarily. But when it comes to built things, maybe casework, et cetera, then yeah, I want, I want that to be pretty ideal. Um, but, Coming from the facilities end, uh, the end user, the real person that is hopefully using the the model um, for you know work literally on campus for for years to come, they don't need that that crazy geometry. They want one ID, one one element that will connect them to whatever system they're using. Because sure, Revit is a giant 3D Excel spreadsheet, and that's wonderful. But you know, at the end of the day, most facilities aren't utilizing all of that data. They want to take something from Excel and merge it with all the PDFs that they're getting, the owner's manuals and, you know, installed guides, et cetera, warranty, you know, who do I call when something breaks, um, into whatever facility software they have. Um, and that's where my job is so interesting because I bridge this gap of, okay, yes, we can put all this information into the model, but we really don't need to and we certainly shouldn't because it's just making your save time and your design time slower. And at the end of the day, you know, if you've got 10 people working on a model, you know, and you're just waiting for each other to save over each other, well, the overhead there is just wasted money. So, you know, profit. <laughs> Where's your profit going? Um, yeah, so I am, I, am I really looking at this data, you know, from inception? Yes and no. I'm, I'm looking at it more in terms of a taking out. Yeah, I think we err on the side of trying to keep things more simple and not over model that oftentimes, especially the complexity of our projects and the size of them, if people are over modeling, it's clearly going to cause problems. And the worst thing is having that miscommunication or miscoordination uh, with, say, specifications and what's in the model. So we really try to not try to keep things lean and think, keep things well coordinated. Good. Well, you know, um, Kara had mentioned about the BIM execution plans, which I think are so important and critical. And I think this is kind of an interesting question. So, you know, I guess at the very beginning of the process, right, when even when you're determining the project delivery system, this this person was mentioning about like whether it's design build or design bid build or um, integrated delivery. Are you thinking about at that point leveraging the ID8 products? Like, uh, do you, do you have that as part of your 
<clears throat> BIM execution plan? No, I, unfortunately, no. I try to keep out all software um, uh, add-ons outside of the execution plan. The only the only thing that is inside the X plan is um, what is the the native software they're using. Are they using you know AutoCAD MEP? Uh, are they using AutoCAD Civil? Are they using you know Bentley products? Are they using Revit? And which year Revit? Keep it at that level because the the extras. You know, at the end of the day, um, it are wonderful. All of them are wonderful, and it's what what is best used for the design team at the time. For me, ID8 is a constant, um, <clears throat> but you know, Dynamo is new and and pretty great, and it does things you know back and forth, but it can destroy models too, and it's very computer specific. Um, you know, if we talk about I don't know all the others that we can use, we use Rhino, we use Max, we use um, SketchUp even. I mean, there are so many design tools that, that flow into the design process. Um, I don't, I try to not put that in writing for a contract document. Yeah, I would say similar that we, um, if you get too prescriptive in a contract like that, as, as I mentioned too, with a lot of our buildings taking, say, three and a half, four or five years from design through construction, um, if we're too specific about software and even versions, it can be hard to upgrade or change you need to through the length of a project without going back to modify the original contract. So we find uh, that's something we try to keep it a little bit as a loose framework. And that's why I call it more of a framework than uh, being too prescriptive in uh, the exact detail. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, here's one actually from an <clears throat> IT professional. They were just talking about like, you know, the ID8 software deployment. Do you have it deployed on multiple computers or is it everyone have access to it or is it something that <clears throat> like Kara as a BIM manager or Dan would mainly focus upon um, so I guess the well actually yeah I was just gonna say Richard um, you know how your licensing works and I have to say as one of the add-on tools I really do like the ID8 licensing model um, so it, it works alongside of your Autodesk uh, FlexLM licensing so your AutoCAD basically your Autodesk suite um, site license, it licenses right alongside that, so it's not a problem for us to install it uh, for all of our staff. So if someone has the Autodesk uh, building suite, they have the ID8 suite of tools right alongside of that. Um, and then it really, as I think Kara was saying, she could help use it as an education moment for people to say, okay, you know, you can follow, this is how Revit says to go and do this. Um, but that may or may not be an easy thing to do, but hey, look what you can do with the ID8 tools. And then I always say, and then more, you know, there's a lot more add-ons and things, some of the sheet tools that are in there. Uh, it is a great way of helping keep your uh, model efficient. And as I said, because of the licensing structure, we're able to keep it available for our entire staff. Um, as I said, we do a few te teams using BIMLink, but it's used less commonly, so we don't need as many seats as that. So it works out pretty well. Well, great. <clears throat> thank, thank you for that answer. I think, uh, you know, we're getting to about the, the close of the presentation. I think most of the questions uh, you actually answered kind of along the way. Um, they were just actually one of the questions was talking about the challenges uh, between like Revit and Grasshopper and Rhino and you sort of already <laughs> talked about that. So, um, you know, it says, do they have, do you have challenges? And I think the answer is yes, everyone has challenges <laughs> with uh, okay. translating <laughs> design geometry from different, um, uh, systems and I also think that that's the complete normal like no one's working in a monolithic like you know 100% Revit it's uh, you know you're working with lots of different systems that need to be integrated together and I think that's that's yeah that's common or that's just the way that we work within the um, <clears throat> when, within our industry so yeah uh, that, that was well I'm gonna I'm gonna tack on to that I mean <clears throat> we we as the you know AEC industry like to talk a lot about how our design flow and our and our process is the most efficient and excellent. No, it's not. It's the worst. <laughs> and that is why I have a job. <laughs> I mean, our tools are constantly changing and constantly merging. I mean, for those that have worked with Revit since inception, you know, this is me. Uh, it has changed almost dramatically from from the first uh, releases of the program for the better. Some things not so great, and some things they still aren't solving. Um, but the IDA add-on, um, I find super helpful for the data, to, you know, um, making sure that the model is super clean. Sure, there are other tools that do this, but I feel like IDA has a very 
very user friendly um, menu and and how it approaches the data. Um, you know, some firms might have the staff to build something in internally. Um, you know, I feel like. Payout are the right size, and any any firm a little bit larger or, or or even smaller will benefit by using these tools. And and like I said before, I've been using IDA tools for years, and for me, it just makes the the the, the process cleaner and faster, so that you know construction documents can go out the door with um, with a feeling of yes, I, I I did it, and it's going to look good, and I don't necessarily have to go in and check every single sheet. Um, you know, I've worked on projects that have over 2,000 architectural sheets. I do not have the time to go open 2,000 sheets, <laughs> but using these tools allows me to to know that the data within the model is good. I'm not passing over some giant piece of you know warnings out the face to my my construction and and end user facility. Um, and that the staff were able to do their job well uh, and fast. So well, I hope this answers all of the ID8 questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear. We really love to hear that. And I, I think that it comes back to what Dan even said earlier was that, um, you know, you guys want to focus on being architects, you know, Payette and many other firms as they should. Focus on the design. That's what you went to school for. That's what, as you said, Kara, we're all kind of, many of us are, in, uh, have the background in architecture, myself included. And, you know, you went to school to design and to uh, ba make an impact on the built environment. And that's what's really uh, important. And so I think you're right in that a lot of the ID8 software tools um, <clears throat> sort of take that burden away from doing a lot of the sort of mundane model cleanup and they help you focus more on what's really important, uh, which is the design yeah. aspect of things. I was going to say, Richard, I think I saw one of the questions and someone had a question. It was more like with uh, the Rhino and process. And I would say, you know, clearly we're utilizing those tools. Not everything we do is about Revit. We're not trying to do everything in Revit. Ultimately, it's where we're producing our, say, construction documents from or that design deliverable. But yeah, we're using all these other, other tools. And one of the things I often say about like our the process. We try to be efficient, but we're not we're not producing the same design over and over again. And, you know, widget type buildings. So for us, everything is a unique design challenge. So utilizing tools like Grasshopper and Rhino, and then using Dynamo and Revit and SketchUp at times too. When I was mentioning, you know, different generations of staff have different tools of preference. Um, and we recognize that you know people are using or need to use the tool that's best for them to design. Ultimately, we need to sort of take what has been been designed and put it into Revit for documentation. And that's where it becomes you know tricky at times. But don't try to get or don't try to uh, replicate everything. I guess might be the way to say it inside of Revit. Um, but use it to sort of again document your design that you may have done elsewhere. And that's where. You know, we're trying to keep that Revit model clean and light um, for production, and that's where ID8 is really helping us to uh, that sort of on track and meet our goals. Well, thank you, both Dan and Kara. This has been extremely enlightening, and it's wonderful to look at the great work that Payette has done across the globe, and also just see, you know, on your kind of the day-to-day -day challenges that you have as a design firm and how your um, you're approaching some of those design challenges. So we very much appreciate that. And I think we're going to, like I said, it's about uh, almost the top of the hour. So I'm going to close up here. And uh, I just want to say it was just my honor and pleasure to have both Dan and Kara uh, be on the webinar today. And I want to thank them for their time and attention. They put together a fantastic presentation. And I very much appreciate it. And I am going to go, I haven't actually been to the Science Center yet at Northeastern. I know they're, you're building the, the second science center um, right across yes. the street, yes, basically. We are. So I'm going to be going yes. there and taking some pictures and doing some uh, site investigation very soon on one of these nice um, spring days here in Boston. So very much appreciate your time and effort. Great. No problem. Thank you, Richard. Thank you to Kara for helping me today. And thank you for everyone for helping uh, us share a story. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, a good webinar and a good. everyone have a good day. Great, thank you.